Welcome to our exciting medical sciences lecture titled, Why is Dental Health So Important for Children? Thank you very much for all of you joining us today. My name is Seta Diop. I am currently an MSI Medical Innovation and Enterprise student here at UCL and your chair for today's event. So today's fascinating lecture will focus on the problems of children's poor oral health and the role of pediatric dentists. Why, with this in mind, please be advised that today's presentation will be featuring some surgical images. We want to keep these lectures as interactive as possible, so please make good use of Twitter and the Q&A function on Zoom throughout to submit your questions to our speaker. The hashtag to use on Twitter is hashtag FMS lectures. I am delighted to now introduce our speaker. We have Susan Parekh. Dr. Susan Parekh is an Associate Professor and Consultant in Pediatric Dentistry at UCL Eastman Dentist Dental Institute. She is the Program Director of the Unique, Blending, Unique Blended Learning MSc in Pediatric Dentistry, as well as Deputy Program Director of the three-year full-time doctorate in Pediatric Dentistry. Her main research focus is dental anomalies, and she is Chair of the UK Clinical Excellence Network for Enamel and Dentine Defects, and has published articles and book chapters on anomalies. Her teaching focus is on technology enhanced learning. So thank you very much, Susan, for joining us today. And now over to you. So thank you very much for this invitation to come and speak and do this public lecture. I think I'm going to start off by really just telling you a little bit very briefly about um, the Eastman Dental Institute. We have recently relocated to near the university campus uh, or the Rockefeller building but we work really closely with our colleagues at the um, Royal National Innards and Throat and Eastman Dental Hospital, which is around the corner from the Rockefeller um, at the uh, hospital. And the reason why it's really important, because you can see I'm going to be showing lots of slides about um, patients that we've treated. So as Sata said, there is going to be quite a few images of teeth, blood and, and sort of surgery. So I hope that doesn't put you off. But it's important to see that we see our patients and treat our patients at the hospital work really closely uh, with our colleagues there. So let's give you a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about this evening. Firstly, what is paediatric dentistry? Um, why I think children's oral health really matters. And then I'm going to give you some examples of the treatments that we provide, some of the research we undertake, and then some of the teaching that we also provide. So I'm going to start off by just addressing that big elephant in the room. I'm sure half of you there kind of going a bit like this image here, the thought of going to a dentist and thinking, oh my goodness, why would anyone ever even want to be a dentist? Okay. So, I mean, you know, the media is not our friend. And uh, we don't usually do very well in the media, but I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, I might have turned some of you around and made you think that actually being a dentist is not the worst thing in the world. And hopefully going to the dentist is not so bad. So let's crack on. Let's start off. What is paediatric dentistry? Well, really, paediatric dentistry is kind of all the forms of dentistry that you would do, but we do them from babies, from newborns. Yep. Yeah? So sometimes children are born with with teeth already coming through and then we have to see them and deal with that and then depending on where you are um, sort of which unit worker then we would see children um, young adults all the way up to 18 yeah so all the things that can happen across that whole age range when children are growing developing and everything those are the sort of people that we see so it's really interesting um, two days are never the same but I'm going to start off by, you know, the majority of our time when we're doing paediatric dentistry is dealing with dental decay or caries, as we like to call it. And here are just a couple of examples of patients of ours. So you can see on my sort of the left hand side of the screen, we've got a young child who typically would sort of present if they've been having a bottle or breastfed for a really long time. And then especially if they're having it at night time, the sort of milk sort of pools around their teeth, um, don't have much saliva they end up with this kind of characteristic decay affecting their front baby teeth. And then you, the other side of this uh, image on the right is a teenager. So now we're in adult teeth, but here you can see that it can be a variety of things. It can be sort of diet or it can be sort of fizzy drinks, um, alcohol, drugs, all these sort of things that young adults might sort of undertake that if they're not looking after their teeth properly, could end up with significant dental decay. The other thing we do a lot of here at the, at the hospital, because we're sort of a specialist center, is we will see children with dental trauma. 
and it can be all manners of things you know I'm always fascinated by how children can be have accidents you know it can be sort of playing it can be at school it very common to have things like um, bicycle um, falling over the handlebars banging their mouth banging their teeth scooters I can always tell what the latest trend is going because um, then I'll see a few accidents happening so for a while we had lots of trampolining accidents when they all became big and so uh, so like I say I'm usually able to keep up with the current trend for children by what trauma comes in but an example on the left here is a child who's obviously had quite significant trauma lots of bruising of the gums but actually their front tooth has been pushed right up into the gum you can just barely see the tip of it there whereas the image on the right is a child where the tooth has been knocked out Okay, what we call a bulse, it's been completely taken out of the mouth. Um, and this was just someone who was walking down the stairs and tripped. So it can be amazing how if you're really unlucky, something can happen and you end up with dental trauma. And, you know, some of these children, dental trauma can be really difficult to manage in long term. We have some children who are with us five, ten years, sort of how we have to deal with their trauma. So it can be really significant. So all I would say is for those of you who play sports, please make sure that you have a, a sports guard for any sort of sports, um, um, because clearly you don't want to, to have dental trauma if possible. An area that I'm particularly interested in is what we call dental anomalies. So this is where the teeth, for whatever reason, don't form properly. So the image on the left screen there shows a child with really big front teeth okay the one on the patient's left side is almost double the size yeah so you can imagine aesthetically that can be a real issue whereas the patient on the right hand side has got missing teeth they have a condition we call hypodonture which means missing teeth and not only that the teeth they do have a really unusual shape so you can imagine as a young child that can be a real issue if you're being sort of teased at school or how to eat properly and so on and then here are some examples of a rare genetic enamel condition that I'm really interested in called amelogenesis imperfecta. And this is where for, um, there's a genetic mutation and then you end up with enamel not forming properly. And so these teeth can be incredibly sensitive because they've got very thin enamel or missing enamel, very difficult to keep clean and obviously quite, they can be quite discolored. And if you imagine if you're a child with teeth like that, it can be really tough, okay. And then lastly, we do things like surgery. So here we have a child where one adult tooth hasn't come through and it's usually because there's an extra tooth kind of blocking its way. So we would have some surgery, we would peel back the gum, remove bone, uncover the tooth that's kind of got a bit stuck uh, and then, uh, then help to bring it into place. So all of these things I've been talking about are all happening and usually in quite young children. And as that picture shows you, children are not young adults. Yeah, they're completely different in their development and what they see. So you have to think about, we have different ways that we have to try and manage their behavior. So it may involve things like injections, giving local anesthetic, but it may have things like sedation, like the bottom image there, or general anesthetic where children are fully asleep so we can do more complex treatment. And why is it really important that we do this properly? Because actually we know, and we were discussing this in panel earlier, for most people, having a bad childhood, a bad experience at the dentist means you're going to be more anxious. Yeah, that's common. And actually there was a study that was done a while back that showed that if you have pain at the dentist, next time you're going to be 19 times more anxious when you go back. So that's going to be worse. So I think it's really important that we make sure that we don't, that we do the right treatment, that we do it in the right way so that children don't experience pain. Hopefully they're not anxious and then they're not going to become anxious adults as well. OK, let's move on to think about, well, why does children's oral health matter? I think it's really important because, unfortunately, I'm going to start off by reminding you that dental decay, caries, is a preventable disease. Yeah, it's something that can be entirely prevented and it is sadly the most common non-communicable non disease in the world, yeah? which is crazy because it's preventable. And if we just look in the UK, 23%, so that's almost a quarter of five-year-olds have already had some decay. And what's really shocking is that tooth decay is the most common reason that a child will be admitted to hospital for a general anesthetic. Okay, so that's really shocking. Like I say, this is a preventable disease. And just looking at data that we have from 2019, 
there were almost no, there were over 8,000 cases of children having to go to hospital to have a general anesthetic to have teeth extracted. And this image you can see here on the left hand side is actually from a colleague in Manchester. And this was just the number of baby teeth that she extracted from one general anesthetic list in one morning. Yeah. So this is really normal for us. It's probably really shocking for all of you, but that's how many teeth we're having to take out. And, you know, can I please remind everyone, this is a preventable disease. So what's the implications of this? Well, imagine this many children having decay, needing operations. So over 50 million has been spent every year on children's teeth, having to have these um, treated. And sadly, we know that a child, if they live in a deprived area, they're going to be twice as likely to have decay. Yeah? So even though this is a preventable disease, it's very much linked to socioeconomic status. Okay. And what are the implications of having dental disease? Well, it's not just having to have an operation or have your teeth fixed, but it, it can impact a child's life, the quality of their life. So we know that children who have dental decay miss days at school, which is so important for their overall development but also they may have problems of eating, problems of sleeping. Yeah? So it really has an impact on that child and the whole family. And my goodness, this has only got worse in the last couple of years. So if we look at some recent data, initially you would think, oh, there's been a 58% reduction in extractions uh, last year compared to the year before. We must be doing something great. Unfortunately not. This has all been due to the COVID pandemic. So during the pandemic, what happened was that a lot of the hospital general anesthetic lists were um, cancelled to accommodate COVID patients. And not only that, a lot of our staff, including myself, were all redeployed to work on COVID wards to help because it was such a need. So it meant that these, and so children who would have been having a, a general anesthetic to have their teeth sorted were just completely uh, on a waiting list and we've been one of the slowest specialties to recover because obviously things like cancer and so on take priority. And so what this is meaning is that actually we have more children who are in pain and suffering and can't even get access to the dental care they need to. Okay, so this is a huge problem that's just getting bigger. And what are the implications for adults? Well, it's not just about children. This is really important. You know, If you don't get it right as a child, it carries on through. We know from recent data that 39% of adults don't visit a dentist. 30% of adults have tooth decay. There are 10 million adults out there who are scared of the dentist, which is such a, a shame. And like I say, COVID has just made it worse. It's made it diff more difficult to access a dentist. And I just put a headline here from Wales, but there were so many to choose from. And you know, all these stories during the pandemic of people saying that they had to rip out their own teeth with pliers because they couldn't get to a dentist. So this is a big problem that's getting even bigger. So hopefully I've set the scene, I've told you what paediatric dentistry is, why it matters for children. Now let's think about examples of some treatment that we provide. So I showed you that image earlier of the child who was falling, it fell down the stairs, one tooth got completely um, ripped out of the socket and the other one was kind of hanging in there. So really common sort of thing we would do would be, first of all, calm everyone down. And then more importantly, make sure that tooth that's come out, put it back into its socket, back into the hole. And all the research has shown is the quicker you can get it back into the hole, back into the socket, the better that tooth has a chance to recover. Yeah. So it's so important if any of you do sort of sports or in schools or anything, you know, if you ever have a child where they do sort of evolve a, an adult tooth, it's so important that we try and get it back in as soon as possible, get to your dentist, and then hopefully they would put something like sort of splint that you can see on the image on the right here. And it's really usually something very straightforward. It's a little bit of wire with some white filling and just holds it in place. And it just means that that tooth, it's a bit like if you broke a bone, you would put a cast or something on and you would kind of keep it for a little while just to help for everything to heal and then take it back off. So dental trauma is something we see lots of at the hospital because like I say, we're a specialist center. So we see everyday children coming in and we can really tell when it's a sort of school holidays and things because we suddenly get a real glut of people coming in, children coming in. Oops, keep losing that. So, so the other thing, like I say, I'm really interested in are dental anomalies. So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of children here where we've done some work. So on the top image, 
This is a child who, where the enamel was missing. Yeah, so half the tooth you can see looks kind of a bit discolored and looks a bit thinner and an unusual shape. And then the bottom half near the gum of those front teeth kind of looks a bit more normal. And the reason for this was, that, um, and something we see really commonly here in the UK is that this was a child who had vitamin D deficiency when they were younger. And so we all need vitamin D, but unless you're getting out and getting reasonable amounts of sunshine, and you know, in the UK today is a great day for it, but it's not always. And so if you don't have enough vitamin B, D, it can affect your bones, but it can also affect the enamel. Yeah? And so there you have where the enamel doesn't form properly. And so that child was having really sensitive teeth, but really being teased and really, really um, affecting their confidence. And so we were able to put some white filling material to cover over the teeth, smooth it over, make the teeth the right size and shape and make them less sensitive. And so that was a really nice result. And actually, if you look at the bottom picture, I think you'd be fairly hard pressed to be able to see that those are fillings and that's not the child's natural tooth. And then remember one of the other images I showed you before was of a melogenesis imperfecta, that condition that affects the, the genetic mutation in the enamel and all the teeth are affected. And so you can see that for that child really affected her confidence, very sensitive, really difficult to keep teeth clean, really difficult to eat. And so in this case, we had to do quite a lot of treatment, lots of appointments so that we could basically cover all the teeth. And it was a real challenge to cover these teeth because the darkness needed to be masked. So it needs lots of appointments. So some of these children come and see us for a lot of appointments over a really long period of time for us to help um, fix their teeth. But already it was lovely to see the difference in her coming in and smiling and feeling so much more confident once the teeth were sort of being protected properly. And in surgery, so this is something we do quite a lot of. So here's some images to show you. So in number one, Box, you can see here's a child, for some reason, the two front permanent incisor teeth hadn't erupted. Yeah. And so they were sent into us. And then in number two, we did some surgery. So we peeled back the gum, removed some bone, and we could see that there were two extra teeth in the way. And that's what was stopping those incisor teeth from coming down. So those were removed and you can see them in number three. You can see they're quite sizable there. And then to help encourage those incisor teeth to come down, what we tend to do is we will sort of um, stick on some gold chains and they really are gold. It's a little bit of bling that goes into the mouth. And then what we do is we then close the gum back up with some stitches. And then what the orthodontist can do is they can pull on those gold chains and bring the teeth into position if they're kind of being a bit lazy and not really kind of coming down by themselves. So we can sort of help them into position. So this is a nice example of the sort of um, multidisciplinary work we do with our sort of orthodontic colleagues uh, for quite a lot of treatment. So those are some of the things we do, those are some of the treatments we provide. Let's talk a little bit about some of the type of research that we undertake um, in paediatric dentistry here at the Eastman. So I am, as I said, and I'm sure you gathered by now, really interested in anomalies. Um, and so particularly conditions like amelogenesis imperfecta. This is a really rare condition, um, but we have probably one of the biggest centers for children with amelogenesis imperfecta in the UK. So we work with a national group um, for pediatric dentists who are interested in amelogenesis imperfecta. And then what we've started doing is some uh, dentist-led genetic testing because previously, genetic testing to say, yes, you have this condition and what is the implication wasn't available readily for amelogenesis imperfecta. So we've managed to set that up nationally and it's fantastic. Um, at the Eastman, we do it as a virtual clinic. So we have a video clinic where we chat to the families, um, explain what genetic testing is, go through all their questions, explain what the outcome of the results would be. And then if they have interest in taking part, then when, when they next come in to see us in clinic, then we would get the consent a, it's a blood sample that we take that and then the results come back to say is it amelogenesis imperfection what time so that's a really amazing new um, service that we're providing but what i've also been doing now for several years is looking at the oral health quality of life yeah so remember i was saying to you we get lots of children who are coming in saying that they're you know not able to eat properly that it's very sensitive difficult brushing not smiling affecting their confidence being teased and so on 
And so we've done quite a bit of work looking at um, how is this, uh, how do these conditions affect children so that we can have a better understanding of what we need to do to try and improve the treatment that we provide and to make sure that we're really trying to make the quality of life better for children. So we, I've done quite a lot of research on this as well. Another area that I'm really interested in is pain management. So do you remember earlier I was saying about how if children experience pain, they're gonna be more anxious. If all of us experience pain, we're going to be more anxious next time we go back. So we've been, I've done quite a lot of work with colleagues in the department where we've done several Cochrane reviews. And for those of you not familiar, Cochrane reviews are like really, really, really um, extensive systematic reviews where we look at hundreds of papers and try and bring together all the evidence to see what is the best way to manage the problem. So I've been involved in several Cochrane reviews where we've looked at how do you manage pain during treatment, so if children are having treatment under general anaesthetic, should we use local anaesthetic as well? And so we've done research on that. And we're currently doing some research where we're trying to see what is the best advice we can give to um, families to manage pain before they can come to us to start treatment. Yeah, because that was something that we really noticed during the COVID pandemic when we were in lockdown and at the beginning. All dental uh, clinics closed during the first lockdown and it was really limited, very difficult for patients to be able to even access us as an emergency centre. And so we were having to give a lot of advice to people over the telephone and trying to tell them how best to manage their child's pain until we could manage to see them because we had so few limited slots we could see people. And I think what became really clear is there wasn't very good evidence for what is the best way to manage pain. So that's one of the sort of research areas that we're looking at as well. We've also got sort of other research where we look at, um, you know, what is the best way to give local anaesthetic to children so that you can make it as painful as possible and nicer. So lots of different sort of ways we look at doing the thinking about the research. And I think what's really important, and maybe you haven't got this across for, um, I'm what you call a clinical academic. So half my week is spent on clinic. The other half is doing research and teaching. And I think being a clinical academic is really important because what I can do is I can look at what's happening on the clinic. I can look at what the issues are. And then I can think about, well, what is the best way that we can address that? What type of research do we need to do to try and answer that question, that problem that we see on clinic? So I think being a clinical academic, it's, it's definitely very hectic. You're forever trying to juggle everything, but really important. Um, and so I, and I think it, it makes a really interesting, rewarding career. What about other types of research that's done in our department? So colleagues have been working on developing a new dental material. So this is um, a material that was is for children, but what was really important, it was designed with children. So children gave us, did focus groups and said, what did they, what would they want from a dental material? What would be the ideal properties? And then using that, we then developed this novel material. And so this is now a really nice example of a type of uh, some research that started in the lab, but now has moved to the clinic. So it's undergoing its kind of final trials and tests and hopefully will be marketed soon. So that's a really, huge, again, a really important way of explaining how being a paediatric dentist is, yes, you're treating patients, that's really important, but it's about seeing that whole scope of what's going on and what can we do to improve dental care for children. And then lastly, another big area that my colleague, Professor Paul Ashley, is really involved with, along with um, colleagues uh, like um, Lexi Line, is looking at sustainability. You know, sustainability is really important. We all know how important it is. But actually, even in dentistry, what can we do to try and improve sustainability? And so they've been working with Dr. Duane, who is in Brett is in um, Dublin, and he's probably one of the leading dentists involved in sustainability. And so what we've been, they've been doing is looking at the environmental impact of all our oral care interventions. And um, really it, simple things like, you know, gloves. So for example, we have gloves that are non-surgical that we do most sort of routine things in. And then we have surgical gloves that we use for surgery. But actually, when they looked at the environmental impact, they found that the surgical gloves had a much bigger environmental impact because of their packaging and so on. 
And so we've actually changed the way that we provide treatment where possible. So we tend to use non-surgical where we can and where it's safe to use to reduce the environmental impact. Yeah. Lexi, one of our colleagues, she looked at the environmental impact of electric toothbrushes and saw that the impact of a, you know, the sort of environmental impact for electric toothbrushes was actually quite high compared to say a bamboo brush. So it's about encouraging people to think about what they do and think about how we impact the planet. And so the sustainability is a really, it's one of the leading areas that we have in the department and it's something that's so important. So, Lastly, I'm going to just talk a little bit about the sort of teaching that we also do, because remember I said I'm a clinical academic, so I do, I treat patients, I do research, but we also do teaching as well. I think we've been really lucky actually at the Eastman because we've been innovators in our field for quite a lot of paediatric dentistry. So for example, we were the first unit to introduce the full-time three-year clinical doctorate in the UK. And so this is for uh, students who want to come and sort of specialize in pediatric dentistry. They tend to come from overseas. And so they come to us, they spend three years with us, living in London, working in the hospital all the time, and then learning all the skills that they need as well as doing uh, research. So that's great. But we also offer a distance learning um, part-time MSc. And this is actually unique in the world. No one else offers this. Yeah. And so this is for those dentists who aren't able to come and travel and live in London for three years. You know, London's quite an expensive place and the course is expensive. So this is an opportunity for people to come to learn all some of the skills they need, but able to stay at home, practice at home. And so we've had uh, students from all over the world, from Australia, Tasmania, Taiwan, Philippines, Kenya, South Africa, um, Caribbean, so uh, America. So yeah, so fantastic. We've, it's really opened up um, opportunities for dentists who are keen to do extra sort of training and learn more about pediatric dentistry. But situation is such that they can't leave their home country and come and study in the UK. So we're really proud of that. And then lastly, we have a, um, we recently developed a MOOC, Massive Online Open Course, okay? And so for those of you not familiar with those, these are free courses uh, that you can access. The UCL one we do is through FutureLearn and it's pediatric dentistry, but for non-specialists, yeah? So the other two courses I was talking about, they're really for those who are interested in sort of specializing or learning more about pediatric dentistry. Whereas this is a three week um, course that you can do at your own time. It's sort of recorded lectures from myself and my colleague, Paul Ashley. And then there are different quizzes that you can do to see, have you understood all the learning? There are different case examples that you work through and then we kind of share experiences. And again, this is, this is one of the few pediatric dentistry MOOCs out there. And so we did it, not sure if anyone would be interested at all. And, and we've really been amazed by the uptake of it. We've had now over 4,000 people who've enrolled to do the program from 91 different countries. Yeah. And I think what's been lovely is that we have a bit at the beginning where we say, hey, introduce yourself, tell us about yourself, what do you do? And I, it's so many different people. So we've, you know, we have dentists, but also we have undergraduate dental students. We have students who are thinking about choosing their A-levels and they may be interested in dentistry. So they want to do the course to find out if they think it's for them. We have sort of nurses who work in sort of emergency care settings and want to know about what to do about dental trauma. Um, and we have parents who are kind of interested in how they can look after their children's teeth better. So I've been amazed by the sort of the breadth of people who have been interested in uh, coming and joining our MOOC. So these are really good kind of tasters, I think, about whether firstly, would you want to be a dentist? And if you would you want to be a pediatric dentist? So if you're not aware of it, do please have a look and see if you think it might be interesting. But we, yeah, we've been really actually surprised at how successful it's been, but how interested people have been in it. So I think that's pretty much it. And I pretty much kept to time. So I'm quite impressed at myself. So I guess in conclusion, I would say, I do think children's oral health matters. 
you know, as I've hopefully shown you, you know, it has huge implications for the child, for the family, but also for us as a society. You know? And I think, and I'm completely biased in my opinion here, that paediatric dentistry is a varied, it's a challenging, definitely can be challenging. If you imagine you've got a small child and you need to try and do a fitting for them, and you know, it's not always easy. You have to do your best kind of uh, play school kind of skills sometimes getting down your hands and knees and really kind of engaging to try and get what you need done but it's a really rewarding career first of all thank you so much for that I thought I was going to be freaked out by the images but actually I wasn't and that was so so fascinating I really really enjoyed that and yeah now we can go over to the questions that we've had submitted um, so the first one we've got for you is um, how can I teach or encourage parents that they should visit the dentist with their child for regular checkup and not only to visit the dentist when they have already got tooth problems? Yeah, that's such a good question. And that is so important because I think the problem is if you if you bring if the child comes to the dentist when they're in pain and we have to do something, that's really not a great first experience for that child. And that's when the anxiety and that, oh, I hate the dentist can come in. So what we try and encourage, and um, there's an organization in the UK called the British Society of Pediatric Dentistry. Uh, and what we try and encourage is that all children, as soon as the first teeth come through, first baby teeth come through at around sort of six months, but definitely before the age of one, all children should be registered and go and see their dentist. Yeah. Hopefully at that age, nothing needs to be done. It can be a really fun sort of uh, occasion where maybe the child will sit in mum or dad's lap and we'll have a little look and they can just get used to the environment. And, you know, it's a really nice, um, easy way of introducing children to the dental setting and also to be able to then give the advice about brushing and diet and so on. So I would really strongly encourage that all children should definitely see the dentist by the age of one. And that way we can hopefully avoid that scenario where the first time they go to the dentist, they're in pain and then something has to happen. Prevention, definitely. I like that. Um, so the next question is about the sugar tax. And if since it's been implemented, you've seen any changes in the extent of children's teeth decay? So, yeah, we were obviously very excited when the sugar tax came in, um, not just for us as obviously dentists, because we know sugar is the main cause for sort of tooth decay, but also because of its associated risk with obesity and other issues. I think the problem's been, though, that since the sugar tax came in, it wasn't that long after that COVID happened. And so because of that, and, and like I say, dental um, practices being closed and people still struggling to get access, us losing our general anaesthetic list. So I don't think we've really had the normal environment to be able to see the impact of the sugar tax properly. COVID really kind of scuppered all that. So at the moment, things are looking pretty bad. And I think things like the cost of living crisis that we know is going on, I think is only going to make things worse because the reality is it's probably cheaper to eat unhealthily than it is to eat healthily, unless you're kind of cooking all from scratch. So I don't know, I don't, I think the benefit of the sugar tax is going to take a little bit longer to show because of the issues that we've had. Definitely, and I know that COVID, if anyone's like me, drank way more fizzy drinks than you otherwise normally would. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, so someone has asked, they have a four-year-old sister who has autism and she completely refuses to let anyone touch her face and they doubt that she would let um, them brush her teeth. Do you have any tips as to how they can convince her to let her to let them clean her teeth? Or will that just come with understanding? Will that understanding just come with her age? That is another excellent patient. And actually that was a whole group of patients I didn't talk about, but we see lots of children with autism. Yeah, and now remember it's a spectrum disease as a whole range. Some will be absolutely fine about things. Others will have lots of sensory sort of issues and particularly around the mouth. So it's taste, smell, all of these things can be really challenging. So for some of our children with autism, we can try and overcome the sort of taste smell aspect of toothpaste, which can put quite a few children off. Um, we have things like um, uh, unflavored toothpaste. There's a brand called Aura Nurse. And if you kind of Google it, Amazon and things have it. And it's really strange. I've used it myself. So it's got no flavor and it doesn't foam. So it feels really weird when you're brushing your teeth, but it can work really well with some of our autistic um, children because it's sometimes it's a taste and smell thing that they don't like. And that's what puts them off toothpaste. 
The other thing I would say for, so for this particular scenario where you've got a four-year-old, sometimes it's because they don't want anyone else doing it. Yep, the moment someone comes near their mouth with something, they clamp and shut up. So even if you maybe put a little smear of toothpaste and whether it's a normal one or the or a nurse well, flavored one on the brush and maybe just get them to just bite and chew on it themselves. You know, they may not be able to get around all of the teeth really well, but at age four, really the important thing is first of all, establishing that habit so they get used to having the toothbrush in their mouth and that doesn't feel so strange, but also it's kind of more important that we get some fluoride from the toothpaste into the mouth rather than sort of removing every little last bit of plaque because plaque removal and sort of gum disease becomes more of an issue when you're sort of um, puberty and hormones and things kick in. Whereas for young children, it's really about um, avoiding dental decay. And that's where the fluoride in the toothpaste is so important. So for this young lady, four year old, I would say maybe try either unflavored toothpaste, see if that helps, or if not, maybe just giving the, the brush or toothpaste to the child and, and seeing if they're, if they're maybe watching someone and they're happy to kind of do it a little bit themselves. Thank you. Um, so we have a bit more of a technical question. Um, it goes, how would you potentially treat a premature child who was born with severe class three mal, mal occlusion and a bad case of obstructive sleep apnea? It would be very difficult to carry out genioplasty due to the undeveloped airways and CPAP would be fairly difficult for a kid to handle. Is there any research being carried out in the development of mandible or maxillar fetuses and how potentially could we alter their growth? Okay, so I guess the first thing I would say is this is a sort of, um, in terms of growth and how you manipulate jaws to try and improve malocclusions, that's really uh, the job of the orthodontist. Okay, so that's a different specialist from pediatric dentists. So they are the ones who do the sort of braces, but also are looking at growth and development and how to use jaws. So in this particular case, I would say it probably would need to be referred to see an orthodontist and probably a hospital orthodontist, I would say. So you would need sort of a consultant. And then they would look at are there ways that you can use different appliances to try and encourage the jaw that's sort of a bit underdeveloped to maybe um, it could grow a little bit more to try and correct the malocclusion. Okay. Um, the next one is where do you see the future of dentist of sustainability in dentistry? Oh, that's a good one. So yeah, I think we really need to look really carefully at what we do. And so, you know, we're so used to, I mean, because of obviously infection control, HIV, you know we're so used to um, using gloves and clearly we change our gloves and we change everything in between patients, which is what you would expect. But I do worry that we've got into this kind of habit of really disposable items for everything. And so, you know, that's a lot of landfill out there. So I, I do think we probably need to look at what we use and are there ways that we can use it so that we can recycle and reuse it better. Yeah. Because I think, yes, infection control was really important. That went one way, but I, I think we need to, first of all, look at can we recycle, reuse, so we're better in that way. And then I also think we need to look at when we're seeing our patients, are we doing the maximum things that we can in one visit so that we're reducing, say, the number of times they come to see us? Yeah. So even things like travel, that's a way that we can help with sustainability. So there's lots of, lots of opportunities in dentistry. And that's a win-win for patients as well. So yeah, definitely. Um, this is a question about your MOOC courses. And I guess it's a twofold question. One is that, is it available for dental therapists? And also, mm -hmm. is there a certificate at the end of completing the course? So it's available to everyone. And we've had quite a few uh, therapists who've done it. So the course is free. But if you want a certificate, so here, particularly in the UK, if you want like a CPD certificate that's recognised by the General Dental Council, then you do need to pay a small fee so that you can um, get the certificate to show that you've done all the training at the end. But otherwise, if you just want to do all the lectures, the quizzes and everything, that's all free and it's open to anyone. Excellent. Uh, so these are questions about you, I guess, and what got you into dentistry in the first place. Uh, the first one is, what is your favourite thing about being a dentist? Oh, okay. So I think the favorite thing about being dead is, is that I like that, you know, you can, it's, it's everyone's least favorite thing. You know, you say you're a dentist and everyone's kind of like, oh my goodness. So it's about, I guess, challenging those sort of stereotypes and those sort of 
thoughts that people have when trying to say no actually you know what if you're a dentist and you're a nice dentist and you care about your patients what you do and you do a really good job then hopefully we can slowly change that image of what of who dentists are and it's you know it's like anything to do with healthcare we, we do this because we want to help people we want to help them get better we don't want them in pain we want them to have lovely smiles we want them to be happy so that's why I enjoy it and so what got you into um, dentistry and paediatric dentistry specifically in the first place yeah, so I mean, I think for me, when I first trained, I was working as a general dentist in a practice, and I was always interested in sort of anxious for the patients, so I used to see a lot of them. And most of them that I would see adults, they I would be saying to them, you know, why are you so scared of dentists? And nearly all of them said it was because they'd had a bad experience as a child. So then I realized like, okay, if I want to make a difference, I'm going to need to be a children's dentist and then hopefully stop them from having that bad experience in the first place so that they don't become anxious and then they're not anxious adults and they're happy to go to a dentist. So that's why I really kind of focused on pediatric dentistry. So you're saying I should have met you about 22 years ago, noted. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> um, so we've got a question here. Um, someone would like to know if you have any tips for their daughter with hypomineralization. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. I mean, I could do an entire talk just on that. So hypermineralization. So this is where the enamel doesn't form properly. The tooth is the right size and shape. So not like those images I was showing earlier, but it because it doesn't um, mineralize properly, the enamel is discolored and it's usually softer. So it can chip and break off. And the most common form of enamel hypermineralization we see in the world, actually, is a condition called molar because it affects the back adult molar teeth, incisor, front teeth, hypomineralization or MIH for short. It's a really common condition. It's about, I think it's about sort of 20% of children. So one in five children uh, will have this condition. We don't really know what causes it, but it can mean that the enamel can be really weak. So I think it's really important that if you, or once your children's adult teeth come to start coming through at around the age of six, if you notice that they're sort of either they're discolored or they get really sensitive or children struggling, um, either you or your dentist need to sort of have a look. And then particularly if we're worried about the back teeth or the front teeth, then you probably need to get referred to a specialist center because there are sort of different treatments that we can do to try and get the best overall smile. So it's a really common condition. OK, thank you. Um, so we have a question here that asks, is it true that it's better to use mouthwash first than brush your teeth? So the research on that is kind of um, not entirely clear. I mean, generally, they, we tend to say it's probably better to use your mouthwash at a different time from when you brush. So if you brush morning, night, maybe use your mouthwash at lunchtime or after school or so on, basically because you're getting in sort of extra sort of dose of fluoride around the mouth. Yeah. But even if you use your mouthwash, uh, usually most people do it, tend to do it straight after or straight before, it will still have a slight beneficial effect. But it seems to be that if you can do it at a different time from brushing, it will probably have the best benefit. OK, um, next question. If trauma happens to a deciduous tooth, is it usually extracted or does the dentist try to reattach it? So that's a really good question. So you remember I was talking to you about that case where the tooth came out, it's evolved, and we said, put it back in. We, that's only for permanent teeth, yeah? So if a deciduous or a primary or a baby tooth is lost, it take, it's um, sort of ripped out the mouth, it's evolved, we never put those back in. And the reason for that is underneath that baby tooth, there's an adult tooth sort of growing very close to where the root of baby tooth was, yeah? And if you try and push it back in, there's a high chance you could damage that adult tooth. OK, so if it's a baby tooth and it's evolved, it's taken out. Um, no, we wouldn't put it back in. OK, if the baby tooth was sort of um, cracked, then sometimes, depending on the child, we would try and put a little white filling on it there. But there are some times where they crack so badly that we do have to extract the baby tooth. OK, um, I guess since you're working in London as well, this is a bit of a local question. What is the quickest way to get a child seen at the dental hospital for extractions under sedation or general anaesthetic? And is there a paediatric dental walk-in service in London? Okay, 
So if you're based in London, so within the N25, there is something called a managed clinical network. Yeah, so it means all dentists who um, treat patients within the M25, there's a referral form that you would fill in for a child or for an adult, there's a specific form for children. And then you would explain what that child needs. And that referral form would then be sort of triaged at a central location. And then they would decide whether that child is suitable to be seen in a hospital or a community dental setting. And then the arrangements would be made that way. Yeah. So if it's within the M25, it's through the referral forms that come from the managed clinical network. If you're outside of the M25, then not, what would normally happen is you, the dentist would do a referral letter to the hospital, the closest one to where the patient lives. And then that would be triaged by us, uh, the consultant department. And then we would decide, is that person appropriate to come and see us? Or is there somewhere closer to where they live, which would be better? Um, or actually they don't need to come and see us. So then that's how we would decide. Okay. Um, in cases of, of amylogenesis imperfecta, you said that some patients' teeth can be treated. How is this disease, how does this disease affect the root area and how is this treated? So luckily, well, luckily or unlikely. So this is an enamel defect. Yeah, so amelogenesis it only affects the enamel of teeth. So actually on the root of your teeth, you don't have any enamel. You have a different layer called cement. So luckily it doesn't affect the root of the teeth. Okay, but so that's good. So teeth don't tend to sort of wobble and fall out. But unfortunately, it's the crown of the tooth, the bit in the mouth that we can see that is affected. And so that's why we need to do if the teeth are discolored or sensitive or sort of look unusual shape, that's where we need to do treatment for them. Okay, um, we've got a question that's asking, what causes impacted canines? Is this genetic or random? As for the person asking the question, this led to them having had an operation. So I'm guessing that's why they want to know. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So a really come so the upper permanent canine is the tooth that has the longest to kind of travel into the mouth. Yep, it starts off really quite high up here and it kind of comes down. And what it does is it, it uses the second incisor, what we call the lateral incisor, to help guide it into place. Yeah, so that's it kind of follows a route and that helps it come down. And so if you have a dental anomaly that can be um, inherited, so something like if the that tooth is missing what we call hyperdontia or if it's really small what we call microdont so it's got a really small root or it's missing then that's when the canine usually can tend to get lost because it's lost its kind of guidance system there are other times where the canine can just get lost because it's just going a bit off course but those don't tend to be usually um, as genetic the reality is we don't really know the etiology but we certainly know that if there's any sort of hyperdontia or microdontia in the other teeth that's very likely that you will have an impacted canine. Okay. Um, so then we've got what determines whether local or general anesthetics are used during treatments on children. Um, I'm seeing here that in uh, in the US, children often go undergo um, because adults often go because adults often undergo local anesthetic rather than children in the USA. Yeah. So whether you have um, local anesthetic or sedation or general anesthetic really depends on lots of different things. It depends on the complexity of treatment, the number of teeth that need to be treated, as well as a child and what they can cope with. Yeah. So all these factors we sort of take into account when we're coming up with the best plan for children. So adults, most adults will be able to tolerate treatment with local anesthetic. Yeah. And that's that would be absolutely fine, particularly if they're hopefully not anxious. Uh, and had horrible childhood experience, they'll be happy to have that. They might need a bit of sedation, but it's unlikely that adults would need general anesthetic for dental treatment on the whole. But obviously for children, it's a much harder, and if it's complex um, treatment like the surgery that I was showing you, that's quite a lot for a small child to have to go through. So that's where it may be that actually a general anesthetic is a, a more appropriate sort of treatment modality. In the United States, they do a lot of sedation, what they sort of call steep sedation, um, which we don't do for young children here in the UK. Yeah. So we tend to use either inhalation sedation, which is a sort of what we call laughing gas or happy gas. Um, so that's a, a lighter sedation, but that can be helpful for most treatments. But obviously, if it's more complex children or if you've got a very young child who can't tolerate inhalation sedation, those sort of times we would think general anesthetic would be most appropriate. 
Okay, so some kind of geographical clinical differences there, what we practice. Um, so this is kind of a question about the more holistic aspect of teeth and how it affects people. And the question is, um, what, what are the psychological impacts of tooth, like teeth issues in children and how can this impact them in their lives? Yeah, so this is a good question. Actually, there's quite a lot of research that's been done on that, both by ourselves and the teams, particularly in Sheffield, where we've looked at what is the impact of having teeth that look unusual in whatever way. So say children who've had dental trauma, children who have enamel discolorations, children who've had uh, meningitis imperfect or other conditions. And certainly we know that there is definitely an impact on the oral health quality of life. Okay, so it affects confidence, it affects whether how they eat and drink, it affects their sort of smile. So lots of things that can be affected by having teeth that look unusual in whatever shape or way. Um, so it's so important, you know, it, it used to be that before you would sort of say, oh, well, let's wait until you're an adult and then we'll fix it then, you know, but we're recognizing that, you know, for children, it's really not appropriate to say that. And if they're being teased or bullied, and it's affecting their schooling and affecting how they feel, then we need to try and do something to make that better. Definitely. Um, this is a question about, I guess, the diagnosis and the use of x-rays for children in, and teeth. Um, it's a twofold asking, should we be concerned with the risks associated with children having dental x-rays? And at what age is the earliest appropriate for children to undergo x-rays? Okay, so if we think about um, are there risks with a dental x-rays, there's risks with any x-rays. Okay, so as a dentist, the, we have this principle of called where we have to think about the justification and the need for any x-ray. Yeah, so you only ever ask for an x-ray if you need that to be able to find out exactly what's happening with that tooth so that you can make the best treatment plan. So it's not something that you just do every time we go to the dentist, it has to be a reason for it. There has to be a justification, yeah, because we are aware that every x-ray carries a very small risk, so that we want to make sure we're only using it where it's needed. In terms of when is the appropriate age to do uh, x-ray, so it very much depends on the child. You know, if a child comes in with trauma at a young age, we may have to do an x-ray because we need to work out, is the tooth a root been broken? Is there still some left in the gum? What's going on? So it may be quite a young age, depending on when they've had the trauma. If there's absolutely nothing wrong with a child, then you're not going to take an x-ray at that age, just routinely for the sake of it. Um, but normally you would imagine that around the age of sort of maybe seven, eight or so, um, you may, if particularly if you think some teeth like the canines are getting a little bit lost, you might consider taking an x-ray just to check is everything developing as it should be at that stage. OK, but no, you would only use you take x-rays because you need it to help you to find an answer to what you can see in the mouth and you want to get a full picture so that you can then decide the best plan. Thank you. Um, so kind of aside from the actual dentistry part of your job, um, how do you deal with any kind of dental anxiety that children may be experiencing? And also for children maybe on the autism spectrum, are there any kind of um, extra techniques that you use to kind of handle any behavioral issues that you might face? Yeah, so as I said, you know, treating children, the, the beauty and I guess the, the reward is that no two children are the same. Yeah, so it's not kind of like, oh, they're five, we're going to do this technique, they're seven, we're going to do that, you know, it's completely varied. And likewise, the children with autism is a big spectrum. So you need to have different tools to work out what's going to work for that patient. So for some children, it might be as simple as techniques that we say we call tell, show, do. So we're going to tell them what we're going to do. We'll sort of show them maybe on there if we're going to talk about doing a coating we might do it on their finger first so they can see how it feels see that it's not scary and then we might do it in their mouth we may use say a, um, a brother or sister older one who's quite cool and happy to have things done they can go first and be a model and then the, the patient who might be a little bit scared because they don't know what to expect this is their first time can kind of see oh okay that's what you're going to do that's fine so those are sort of simple techniques we can do. It's about using the appropriate language to explain things so the way that a child can understand. But if you're, particularly for say things like autism or if we're doing some treatments, 
distraction can be really helpful techniques. So it could be simple things like having a projector on the ceiling, which has got a little kind of cartoon or an image um, that they can look at and it's something to help focus on. Or it could be um, there are sort of like video glasses we used to have where you could kind of choose your favorite DVD film and then put the video glasses on and be watching that um, while you're having your teeth sort of done. So um, lots of our, particularly our autistic patients, the parents will normally come in with sort of an iPad or a phone, you know, they may have a favorite kind of program that they watch all the time. And so the parent can kind of hold that up. And so the child can be looking at that while we're doing the work. Yeah. Um, you used to have one parent who would read and it was really lovely because actually they had a really nice voice and they would read the story and the patient, me, the nurse, we'd all be listening really nicely to the story and it was a really lovely thing. So there's lots of different simple ways that you can use distraction to kind of um, take it away the focus of well, everything's inside my mouth. Yeah. And those are nice ways that you can kind of use for autistic children. We do things like sort of Makaton as well, where we show we have sort of um, we'll send information before they come so they have an idea of what it's going to the hospital is going to be like. And then we've got a place specialist who will show them what all the different rooms and things are so that they have a, a visualization uh, and an understanding of what's going to happen. And that can all be done through things like Makaton, which are where you have pictures to sort of show what everything is. So there are lots of different techniques we can use. I can personally attest to the distraction being a successful technique. My favorite dentist had a world map on the on the ceiling that kept me distracted and happily doing my dentist treatment. So definitely, I like that. Um, I guess this is a question related to your, you mentioned kind of the multidisciplinary aspect of your job. And the question is, how can pediatricians work to improve dental health as well? Oh, that's a really good question. So yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we need to make sure we're all working as a team because it's so important. We're all seeing these children in different sort of settings and it's about making sure that we're giving the same consistent message and that we're not contradicting each other. So pediatricians, absolutely, um, you know, health visitors, nurses, GPs, everyone can sort of help to kind of remind. And it's, it's not just about teeth. Obviously, that's very important as far as I'm concerned, but it's about general health. You know, it's about tackling things like obesity and so on. So it's about all of our all healthcare professionals who see children and families about reinforcing you know the fact that we do need to limit sugars that we need to have sort of you know brushing twice daily and that we need to just be doing these simple things to hopefully prevent any of the sort of uh, decay problems things like trauma that's harder to, to prevent because kids love to run around and play and do whatever but like I say at least things like sports guards can definitely help for sports but Dental caries, which is the biggest thing we're dealing with, that is something that we can all work together with to try and improve the education for that. Okay, so in the last few minutes, we want to turn to kind of the future of dentistry and pediatric dentistry specifically. Um, we've got a question that is asking, what new innovations are revolutionising dental care today? Oh, that's a difficult. Well, I mean, I think hopefully some of the things that I've shown and talk, spoken about. So, you know, it's about using new materials so that hopefully materials where you don't have to drill the tooth, that you can either fit a filling in or put a crown on so that it's a much, you know, you don't have to give local anesthetic. So all of these things can hopefully make it a much nicer experience if you are having a filling, but also looking at things like sustainability and things and about how we can make sure that dentistry isn't um, contributing to all the issues with landfill and that we're doing the best we can to be as sustainable as a society as possible. And the last one, I think we've got one more, is how do you see dentistry evolving in the future? Big question. Um, I know. So I think, yeah, that's a really big question. I, I think for NHS dentistry in the UK, sadly, I don't see it getting any better. I just see it getting worse because we seem to be losing dentists from our NHS more and more. Um, there are lots of issues with sort of how dentists are paid for what they do. And, and particularly for children, this is a huge problem because really dentists don't get paid for treating children and the amount of time it takes. So sadly, I see NHS dentistry becoming more and more of an issue, harder for people to access, fewer dentists um, practicing, and therefore things getting worse, unfortunately, before they get better. 
things like water fluoridation that might help to try and get things better but yeah it's not looking great sadly yeah I think that's just the NHS as a whole like you said it's, it's pressures on it that struggling to meet the demands that we've got but unfortunately we've just run out of time so we'll have to leave it there I just wanted to say a massive thank you to you Susan Perek that was really really interesting and the questions as well absolutely fantastic um so for the audience out there if you could please provide us with your feedback about today's session by filling out our survey which will be sent to you following today's event that would be really really appreciated by us and um, we also want to let you know we have another fascinating lecture titled What is Evidence-Based Medicine and Why Does It Matter? which will be happening on the 14th of June with our very own Karichi Gurusame, Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine and Surgery at UCL. We would love to see as many of you there as possible and the details will be sent out to you. And once again, thank you so much for joining us today and delivering that talk and for everybody joining us. Have a lovely evening and enjoy the last rays of sunshine. <laughs>